Hello, uh, my name is, Julie, is Dr. Julia Osman. I am a French history professor at Mississippi State University, and I am here today to talk about certain aspects of the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution. Uh, the Society of the Cincinnati has a new project where they are trying to make lectures available for high school teachers that cover some of the national standards for uh, some of the national standardized testing, and so I am here to talk about certain of those standards. So these lectures are not a complete history of the Seven Years' War or a complete history of the American Revolution by any, any means, and they're not intended to be, but they are intended to focus on uh, certain elements of the national standards to help high school teachers um, have more resources when they teach and when they prepare for their classes. So I'm going to begin with a, a short talk on the Seven Years' War. And I've entitled this talk, um, Not Just French and Indians, The Seven Years' War in North America, uh, because it's important to remember that uh, the Seven Years' War is really a world war. In fact, uh, Churchill called it the first world war. And this is, this, is, this is an accurate representation, because we think of the Seven Years' War as, oh, the French and Indian War in North America. But it was much, much, much larger than that. And it helps to understand some of the things that went on in North America if you keep in mind that this war really stretched in, throughout Europe from Portugal to Russia. It had had great effects for Africa. It was also fought in the Caribbean. It was fought in India. Um, and it was also fought in all of the seas. And so the navies were a huge component of the Seven Years' War. And the Seven Years' War just didn't involve France and England. It also involved Prussia. It involved Hanover. It involved Russia. It involved um, uh, uh, the, the, the sepoys in India. And so it was a huge, huge, huge fight. And it even some, some historians even say that it had consequences for the silver trade in China. So this is a world war. And that said, I am going to focus on the North American part, um, just because that's, that's the part that we're interested in and how the Seven Years' War had consequences for the coming American Revolution. But just keep in mind during the talk that this is much larger than, than what I'm initially focusing on. Um, so that said, uh, a lot of people want to know, what are the French doing in North America in the first place? Because we in American history are used to North America being a place where there are English-speaking people and, and also Amerindians. So what are the French doing there? Uh, and that's a good question. And this question goes all the way back to shortly after Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492 and thought he discovered not some islands on the Caribbean, which he did not expect to find because he did not know they were there, but he, he of course, thought he found some islands off the coast of Japan. And even after he died and had been back to visit these islands four times, he still thought, he was still convinced that he had found Japan. And everyone kept on saying, no, you have not found Japan. You have found something completely different. And he, he didn't believe that. But anyway, there was still a search for the China Sea, which is that many Europeans thought that if they sailed far enough west, eventually they would hit China. And when America, the, the American subcontinent, was initially rediscovered by Europeans, they had no idea how big it was. And so I have a handy map here, um, which you can find on Wikicommon, so you can use it for, for any kind of purpose. It's on the public domain. And we all see how big North America is, but in the, sixth, in the beginning of the 16th century, very end of the 15th century, they had no idea if it's just a little strip of land, and behind this little strip of land is the China Sea. They didn't know that if you followed some of these waterways far enough, if you would get to the Pacific Ocean, they had no idea. So in the 16th century, um, in 1524, Francis I of France, he's, I kind of call him the Renaissance king uh, in France, hired an Italian named Giovanni Varanzo to sail around the, this, this new land form and see if he could find the China Sea. And Giovanni sailed into the, the Cape of Fear um, in North Carolina, and he saw enough waterways that penetrated far enough into the land to think, hey, this might actually lead to the China Sea. And so the French con continued to send explorers to go look for the China Sea. And while they never found that, what they did find was lots of cod, which I know sounds very exciting, and, and of course beaver. And cod is very important because uh, and they found lots of cod fishing up in the, the northern regions of North America and in, in the waters there, because of course Europe is a largely Catholic Catholic continent. Uh, in, in, those, in Catholicism during those times, during Lent, you did not eat meat, you ate fish. And so it was a very profitable business to catch cod, to put them in giant salt barrels, and then ship them back to Europe. And many months later, people would eat it for Lent. And that sounds very tasty, but it did, it did keep the French interest in North America. And as I mentioned, the French also found beaver pelts there. And beaver hats had just become the latest must-have in Europe. And when you think of a beaver hat, it's not like a, a Davy Crockett hat with the raccoon sitting on his, on his head, but they use the beaver pelt, which is a beautiful, smooth, shiny pelt to make like, um, and what we see today are like beaver top hats. And of course, back then they had different shaped hats, but that, that pelt was very important for making those kinds of hats. 
and things. So the French were able to make a very profitable trade by hunting the beaver. Um, now there are many explorers, French explorers in North America who did many important things um, and you can actually research those if you want to if you follow one of the links below the YouTube video that you're watching right now. Um, and one of the links is to a, a, a wonderful site um, about Louisiana which is another French war, another, another area of America that, that France had uh, had settled. They did, weren't just in Canada, they were down in Louisiana as well. And so there's a wonderful site that talks about the explorers who, who founded Louisiana and when the cities were, were established and they have interesting biographies of those explorers and some fantastic maps. Uh, also there's a link um, below me to a map from the 16th century and it shows kind of the Labrador area as it was drawn by a French cartographer. And it's fascinating because you can see sea monsters, you can see demons dancing around in this new world and it, it shows uh, uh, images of, of Native Americans fishing and hunting and dancing uh, and it's a really interesting picture to look at as you understand what the French initially thought of this of this new landmass. Um, but the other the other explorer I want to make sure I mention is of course Champlain um, and Champlain was in North America and he was able to establish a relationship with the Iroquois and the Huron in 1608 and this is important because now France didn't just have economic ties in North America, they also had a certain kind of diplomatic tie and it also starts to explain how the settlement pattern for the French in North America was different than the English. Because if you look at the way the English settled in North America, they really wanted to create new England, or you know, little England in North America. They didn't want anything to do with the Amerindians that were there, except maybe a little bit of trading. They wanted cities that looked like English cities. Uh, they wanted dances that were English dances. They really wanted to have England, but just an ocean away. The French, on the other hand, had a very different settlement pattern. And because the French are focused very much on, on, on beaver and fishing, and because they're making these diplomatic um, ties with the Iroquois and the Huron and other Amerindian nations in North America, they are settling over a much wider expanse of land. Um, but, and they're also using, and they have to use, information and techniques and alliances that the Amerindians have been using. So what they do is they cover a much larger piece of land, and again, you can see this on this lovely map where it's colored on the coast to be um, uh, uh, English settlements and it's colored deep you can see all the way it's kind of like an upside down triangle all the way from upper Canada down 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 until the Gulf of Mexico uh, and they covered this wide spark piece of land so they could um, get more beaver, make more settlements, and things like that. So you see a very different settlement pattern. And uh, eventually the, the French are really coming to North America for one of four reasons. One is they're looking for the China Sea, which eventually they give up and they, they stop looking for it because North America obviously has many other riches besides being maybe, maybe close to China. Uh, two, uh, the French are there as, as Catholic missionaries. Uh, because the, 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 the French take on Amerindians in North America initially was not that these are savage or barbaric peoples necessarily, but that they are wild. They haven't been tamed yet. Uh, they, they are this wild, this wild type of man who has not yet been affected by society. So when missionaries would come, they would not only try to uh, uh, convert some of the Amerindians to Catholicism, they would try to domesticate that's their word. They would try to domesticate these wild men um, and not necessarily make them French because they could never be French, but to try to make them uh, you know, more, more self-controlled, not as violent, make them good Christians. And so you, you see missionaries, French missionaries, a lot in North America. The other reason why you would see the French in North America is because they are, they are into that beaver trade or they are trying to make some kind of trade in North America. And the French who came to North America and stayed and continued to stay for generations became French Canadians. And French Canadians, because they were so enveloped in the fabric of life for, um, uh, uh, for with, with, with the Amerindians in North America and because they were so accustomed to the landscape and they were so accustomed to earning their living in North America, um, they stopped resembling the French and kind of became their own kind of person. And the fourth reason why you see the French in North America is to come to America quickly, look around, establish some kind of business, and then escape to France as quickly as you could. Because there was a, a very common belief through uh, beginning from, from the discovery of America, or rediscovery of America until, um, until the, the middle of the 18th century, that if you stayed in America too long, the air and the water and the plants there and the atmosphere would actually make you depreciate and evolve and eventually you would turn into a sauvage, you would turn into a wild man uh, like the Amerindians. And so, you know, French, French people, you know, fresh from Paris, right off the boat would step into America and they'd see the Canadians and think, oh no, if I stay here, that will be me and I will no longer be French, I will start to be a sauvage, I will start to be a wild person. And so they would establish their business and run back to France as quickly as possible. So you never saw the kind of settlement pattern in New France that you, that you got with New England. 
So, and this is what the French are doing in North America. Um, now, let me check my titles real quick. Now, often with this, with this settlement pattern, these different settlement patterns, um, of course you would see violence break out in North America between the English and the Amerindians and the French. And this, this was a, an, a, I don't want to say a common or frequent, but this was a regular and un, not unexpected occurrence. And sometimes there would be fighting in Europe, like with the Nine Years' War in the 17th century, which would spill over into the colonies in North America, and that was called King William's War in North America. And the, the Amerindians especially inhabited this kind of nebulous middle ground, is the term the historians use, to try to negotiate between the English and the French. And a way to help your students understand kind of what the middle ground is, is if you get three, three of your students and you get a circle of, of string or rope and have each student hold on to a piece of that and kind of lean back. And so you kind of have this very delicate balance. And if someone shifts their weight, everyone has to shift their weight. Because the Amerindians are, of course, using the fact that there are two, mm, two groups of people who don't always get along, the, the French and the English. They're t the Amerindians are taking advantage of this to kind of play one off the other at times. And so everyone, of course, has their own interests at heart. But you have this really interesting, you know, kind of three-pronged balance here. And, of course, violence is going to break out from time to time. Now, violence breaks out as kind of a prelude to the Seven Years' War in 1754 with Jumonville's Glen. And um, the Seven Years' War doesn't begin with Jumonville's Glen, because remember, the Seven Years' War is a world war. And it really begins in 1756 with the Battle of Minorca, which is, in the, which is a large naval battle, and it takes place in the Mediterranean. But you see some of the initial violence in North America that's going to kind of be a prelude to this war with Jumonville's Glen. And Jumonville's Glen is a wonderful story that I think your students would appreciate. Uh, and, and it features a, a very young man a very young Anglo-American man. He was, he was raised in America, but he loves England. And he, he's, he's working for the English government, and he's working in the, in the, um, in the, the English army as a, as a provincial officer. And he is given the task of going into western Pennsylvania with some of his troops and some Amerindian allies that he has. And he is given the task of looking to see where exactly the French are. And he is allowed to use violence if he sees the French encroaching on English territory or disrupting English trade because the English were very afraid that with the French so deep in North America, they were going to disrupt English trade with uh, Amerindians and others. And so, so this young man takes his, takes his troops, and he takes his Amerindian allies, and he goes through, and he uh, uh, you know, is, is, is looking for the French. And he's kind of aware that there's a French group kind of following him and tracing him. And he thinks, aha, rather than be ambushed by these French people who are following me, I will ambush them first. And so early one morning, this, this young man and his, and his, uh, and his troops and his, uh, and his Amerindian allies, they, they creep up and they find the French and they open fire and they kill many French people and the whole time there's a man waving a white piece of paper at him. And so finally the officer calms everybody down to look at this white piece of paper. And this young man is an Anglo-American. He doesn't understand any French. And of course the letter is in French. And of course the person trying to hand it to him is French. And the person who's trying to hand it to him, by the way, is a, is a French man named Jumonville. Jumonville. And so while this, while this young man is trying to read the letter, one of his Amerindian allies takes a tomahawk, splits the head of Jumonville, and then starts to ritually wash his hands in the dead man's brains. This is a wonderful story. So the Anglo-American officer it panics a little bit. He takes the message, which essentially is a message of peace, saying, we want to know what you're doing here. What are you doing here creeping around? Um, and he starts, he starts to head back back to the east. And of course he's being, he's being followed because now he's done horrible violence against the French. Now he's being followed by a man named Villiers, who is Jumonville's brother, who is of course seeking revenge. And this man is, is, is running with his, what's left of his troops and left of his Amerindian allies. It's pouring rain. He's not making much progress. He knows he's going to have to make a stand because the French are encroaching on, on him. So he stops and he builds a fort out of pure necessity and he names the fort Fort Necessity. And after, after some time of fighting with his, with his enemies, he finally says, I have to surrender to the French. There's no way I can make a stand anymore. And so Villiers approaches this young officer, and he, he presents him with essentially a surrender treaty, and he has, which he has to sign. And the surrender treaty seems to be pretty generous because he's allowed to keep his life, he can keep his troops, he only has to give over two hostages, and he can return to his commander. And so he, this, 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 um, the surrender treaty is in French. The Anglo-American still does not read French, but he signs his name to it and goes on his way. What the poor man does not realize is that when he signed his name, he signed a full confession to the murder of Jumonville, 
which, since this is a little skirmish that happened in the backwoods of western Pennsylvania, might not seem like such a big deal, but it set off a huge diplomatic catastrophe as people back in France reacted very violently to the idea that their men in North America are being murdered in cruel and harsh ways by the English barbarians. And it puts a lot of patriotic fuel into France. And if, if you can imagine that, there's, a, there's an American song um, that's very popular on the radio now, and it's, it's, it says, you know, if you attack us, we'll stick a boot in your ass. It's the American way. That's kind of the French reaction to, to, to the massacre of Jumonville. Now, what makes this even more interesting, and, and, and this, of course, stokes the fires for war. Even though war has not broken out yet, it won't break out for another two years. But there's already violence in North America over tensions between the British and the French and, of course, various Amerindian nations who are trying to negotiate their way between them. Now, the name of this Anglo-American officer who took full credit for the murder of Jumonville's Glen was George Washington. And yes, the very same George Washington that was going to eventually be general of the American forces during the American Revolution and our first president, and many consider him to be the best president of all time and one of our national myths and our great man, and you can go to Mount Vernon and buy lollipops that feature his head on it and all kinds of wonderful things. But just keep this in mind with your students that if you have a bad day or if your first job doesn't go the way it's supposed to, George Washington had his bad days when he was a young man too. And his bad day was really, really bad because not only was a man uh, uh, killed under, um, un under his guard, uh, unjustly killed under his guard, but he actually started off this huge diplomatic brouhaha um, for the, for that, that, that contributed to, to the Seven Years' War getting started. And so the Seven Years' War begins, and of course there's already violence uh, in North America. Let me see what my next chapter is. And when violence breaks out in North America as part of this larger global Seven Years' War, um, the French had some initial victories. And the French should have won the Seven Years' War. They really should have, because they had a lot of advantages going into the war. Uh, for one, uh, they had uh, the Canadian militias. And remember, the Canadians, these are, these are Frenchmen. They are of French descent, but they've been living in Canada for generations. They are very tough. They know the landscape very well. They know how to work well with Amerindians. In fact, some of my sources even say that Canadian youths and Amerindian youths would grow up together and kind of learn each other's habits and each other's, each other's ways. So that's a, definitely a very good resource to have if you're fighting a war in North America. Uh, the French also have most of the Amerindian allies because they've been working and trading with the Amerindians for so long, and they've had diplomatic relations with the Amerindians since 1608. Uh, so they, they have very good uh, uh, Amerindian allies. And then the, the French army proves to do very well when it initially arrives to North America. Um, and I just, I would like to illustrate so some, some of the initial French victories that kind of explain how the French had some, some real positives on their side at the beginning of this war in North America. And the first thing I'd like to talk about um, is Braddock's defeat. Now, Braddock's defeat is probably well known if you live in Virginia. In fact, you can see the point where Braddock departed to, to go forth and get defeated. If you live in Alexandria, there's a little, at, 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 the, at uh, Russell Street, there's a little tiny um, cannon that's mounted right in the middle of the road because that is where Braddock departed. And it's actually called Braddock Road. Um, uh, and, and Braddock's defeat is much studied by historians, but I'm going to talk about it just to show how the French were able to use English tactics of war against them. And for this, I'm going to need a few volunteers. And this, this might be something fun to do with your students um, uh, to help, help illustrate this part. So if I could have maybe three people uh, come up and just stand next to me. And all you have to do is stand. It's not going to hurt. And just I'll put you two over there. And you can, you can stand right here. OK. So if we're, and we're all squished together. Squish in, squish in. All right, this is good. This is good. Ah, shoulder to shoulder. This is good. All right, now, the way that Europeans fought in the 18th century was to maximize their firepower because guns at that time were smooth bore, which meant that you would have a ball going through a tube, a smooth tube. And as that ball is going through the tube, it's gonna kind of ricochet and bounce around because there's nothing to keep it on a smooth trajectory. So when your ball is gonna exit your musket, it could go kind of in this direction, it could go kind of in that direction, it could go straight, it could go where you aim it, it could go where you're not aiming at all. It was very inconsistent. So if you want to, so if, if you just have me and I have my musket and I'm pointing my musket at Rick, the camera guy, and I fired at Rick, it could, hit Rick, it very likely would not hit Rick, and Rick would not have any ill effects from this musket ball. However, if I have a line of troops like this, like we are right here, in fact, that line would go, would stretch far, far, far out. There would even be people behind us. There might be people leaning down in front of us. And we all took our guns, and if you can just use a hand as a gun, and you all pointed at Rick. Yeah, if we all point our guns at Rick and fire at the exact same time, something's going to hit Rick. Poor Rick. Okay, thank you very much. Oh wait, no, before you go. But let's say, but you know, this takes some time and it takes time to load your gun 
if you can do a couple shots. A minute, you're doing good. And so there are times when the English are just kind of standing here. And they're not just standing around and waiting for time to go by. They're standing around and loading their weapons and getting ready to, to fire again. But they're very vulnerable when they're like this. And if you can imagine, we, here we are, we're standing, we're getting ready to fire at Rick. And while we're getting ready and we're loading our weapons, we're trying to fire at Rick. If Rick is very quick, and he can leave the camera, and he can run behind us and hit us on the back of the head with something, Rick is going to be pretty good, and he's going to be just fine. So while the British are able to maximize their firepower, and this is, this is what you do in Europe, when they're in North America and there are other ways of fighting, you have Amerindians fighting, you have the French fighting, you have Canadians fighting who fight different from Europeans, they also kind of make themselves a giant sitting target. And remember, they are in the middle of the woods wearing red coats, so they're not hard to find. And so this is part of what happens at Braddock's defeat, is that you have very well-trained, very disciplined English soldiers who know what they're about and they know what they're doing. But when you have people running around you and hitting you on the head with hatchets, it's not as effective. Thank you, volunteers. You are wonderful. And so this might be something that your students um, would enjoy, especially if they, can, if they can pick their own target that they can, they can fire at. But this is what you see at, at, at Braddock's defeat, because at Braddock's defeat you have Braddock who is a, a, a British officer, he has British troops with him, he has some American provincials who have been trained to act like British troops. They're used to lining up and firing and doing all this in, 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 in good time, but the French have Amerindian allies and they have their Canadian militiamen. And their Amerindian allies and their Canadian, Canadian militiamen are used to fighting in different ways and they can kind of use the British tactics against the British. And that's the kind of thing you see at, at Braddock's defeat. And, the, and you, you see this kind of, uh, these, these kind of victories for France and other places as well. And the French are really great at organizing raids against English settlements kind of on the frontier lands and really just using fear tactics to scare uh, British settlers farther and farther and farther eastward and trying to clear them out because, you know, if, you, if, if, if your neighbor was just massacred and scalped and had his house burned down, you know, two miles away from you, it might encourage you to, to just kind of let the French have it and move east. Um, another way that the French were able to, to, to do very well in the Seven Years' War in North America is they were able to use European tactics very effectively. And you see this at the siege of Fort William Henry. And Fort William Henry, as, as you can tell by the name, was an English fort, uh, and the French are going to attack it. Now, the French are very very good at sieges. The French army is great at laying siege to things. Uh, uh, in fact, a, a French man from the 17th century named Vauban invented it uh, and invented the, the technique the French use. And so the French are able to use European styles of taking forts very, very well. And they dig trenches. Well, if you'd like to see how the French take the fort, there's a wonderful YouTube video, the link for which is provided underneath the video you're watching now. And it's a short clip uh, from the Last of the Mohicans film. Uh, and it's, the, the film is itself is, it's based on a, a novel about the Seven Years' War, so it's very much, the film is very much according to the novel, so it's not always a great historical resource, but there's a wonderful couple minutes where the camera kind of spans over the siege, and that's a pretty well done, pretty accurate siege, and I can tell you what you're going to see in that clip. And what you're going to see is you're going to see French soldiers and Amerindians working together to dig trenches, because the idea is that you have lots and lots of heavy artillery guns that you want to use to batter the fort. But the fort's all the way over here, the artillery guns are all the way over here, so you need to move those guns towards the fort. To do that, you dig a series of trenches. And you dig trenches that are kind of, fun they're kind of zigzaggy, funny shapes, so that if part of the trench is hit by enemy fire, the whole trench doesn't blow up, just a little piece of it. They reinforce those trenches um, with, with things that look like baskets, with woven, um, uh, uh, woven branches, woven sticks. Uh, you know, sometimes they've got sod or they've got other things to kind of absorb the blow if something is hit with a cannon. And you'll see lots of digging of trenches in this clip. Um, you'll also see cannonballs come from the English fort and hit a trench, and a guy will kind of jump. But it won't blow the whole trench up because it's so well reinforced with all of these nut lovely baskets. Um, you see Amerindians exiting from the trenches to go and try to make small skirmishing, um, small attacks on any of the English who exit the fort, um, also to help kind of move these artillery guns forward. Uh, and then once you have the artillery guns through the use of trenches, once you have them moved kind of to the first trench, you dig a trench, another trench even closer, and you bring your guns even closer, and you slowly bring your guns closer. And when you can bring your mortars close, and your mortars, um, that's going to be the gun you see in the clip. It's like a huge, it looks like a huge cauldron. It's a big, big, big wide mouth. And if you bring that close to the fort, you're, it's going to allow you to actually shoot a cannonball out of that, up, 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 high, 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 sloop over a little bit, and then go boom, either right in the fort or right on the walls. And that's going to cause the fort to have to surrender. And in fact, in the clip, you also see the two armies meet to discuss surrender terms. Because the idea of European warfare wasn't that you kill everybody, but that you put your opponent in a position where he knows he's either going to get obliterated or he could surrender. 
And at this point, if your enemy has fought well and is ready to surrender, you can negotiate that, okay, you have to leave and your army can never fight in this war again, but you will survive. Um, and that, that, that is what happens at Fort William Henry is the French lay siege to the fort, they do a really good job, the fort eventually has to surrender and it surrenders and the French accept the surrender and it's an example of how the French army from France, not necessarily the, not just the Canadian militiamen, not just the Amerindians, but how the French army is able to use European warfare effectively in North America. Uh, and then there's a, a third example I'd like to use very briefly and it's the Battle of Carillon or we know it in English as Ticonderoga. At the Battle of Ticonderoga, uh, the French army is, is being attacked from an, from an entrenched position by the, the British army, and the British are attacking the French. And the French uh, um, are, are outnumbered two to one, and they have some Canadians with them, but not a lot, and they don't have any, any Amerindians with them at all, and they've really come to rely on Amerindians to help them win their battles. But after, after a couple hours of fighting, the French beat the English and the English retreat and many of the English are killed and not too many of the French are killed and this is a huge victory for the French because the French army was able to essentially fight the, fight the battle on their own without the use of Amerindians. And for the French this is fantastic. They did it all by themselves, they didn't need the Amerindians, see the French army is very strong, but it makes some of the French officers a little too excited about their victory. And so some of the, when the Amerindians do show up and they see the battle's over, it's been fought without them, they get very cranky. Montcalm, who is the general in charge of the French army, does not apologize and say, we're sorry we didn't wait for you to have this battle. Instead, he rather gloats and says, see, we didn't need you after all. This makes many Amerindians angry and they decide to leave the French since they're only, on, they're only with the French because this gives them an opportunity, opportunity to prove themselves in warfare and get war trophies for themselves. So some, some, many of them go to the English. And it kind of, it kind of gives uh, the French army the false impression that it's pretty much got this war taken care of, which it, it doesn't, unfortunately. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about why the French ended up not winning the war in North America. Um, and there, there are two, two things I'm going to talk about with this. And one is, first of all, the Battle of Quebec. And the Battle of Quebec, and this, this was a, a, another time where the, now the French are entrenched in the city of Quebec, which is a big, beautiful fortress in Canada, and the English are going to attack. And Montcalm, the officer who's in, the general who's in charge of the, the French army in North America, he really should have just sat tight and waited for reinforcements because there were other French officers in the field. There were Canadians he could have waited for who would have helped him. But he didn't sit tight and wait. He wanted to go out and meet the English on the Plains of Abraham. So when he went out to meet the English on the Plains of Abraham, uh, he did not have enough troops um, and they were not well enough organized. He was trying to use lots of Canadian militiamen to fight like French soldiers standing in that line and firing, which is not how the Canadians are used to fighting. Uh, and, and it was a, a very large, very important battle in which both he, uh, General Montcalm, and the British general, General Wolfe, died. And because it was a very big, uh, uh, exciting, engaging, even sexy battle, a lot of people look at that battle and see that was the loss of France in North America which isn't quite the case, and I'll explain why in a second. But first, since we're talking about the deaths of Montcalm and Wolfe, uh, which were very uh, well publicized uh, in Europe, I want to take the opportunity to show you some interesting uh, pictures of that. And the first thing I um, would like to show you is this wonderful portrait of the death of General Wolfe. And this is a portrait, um, it was very popular, it was, it was painted a few years after he died. And if you look at the portrait, you can see that General Wolfe is dying very beautifully. And he's able to do it without, even though he's been shot several times, he's able to do it without shedding any blood. He's just dying very beautifully. And he's surrounded by, by, by his men. And you can see that there's an Amerindian warrior. This represents that his allies, his Amerindian allies, you know, sitting there looking at him. And everyone looks very sad and very resigned and they're very upset. And you can see the battle on the Plains of Abraham for Quebec being waged in the background. And if you look very closely, there's a man standing right here towards the, the very edge of the picture. And he hold, he's holding a flag and he's holding his hat out and he's running. And essentially what he's, he's coming, he's coming to deliver the news to Wolf that you have won the battle. And Wolf died knowing that he had won the battle, which I don't know, maybe it made dying a little better, maybe not, but it probably didn't look like this. And now this picture and this portrait is not supposed to be a literal uh, snapshot of what Wolf's death looked like. And so, because we're so used to, to, to photographs and things in our culture, sometimes we look at things and think that's exactly what it was. And this is not exactly how it happened, but this is how it's using symbols and it's using you know, specifically placed people in order to kind of tell you something about Wolf, tell you something about the battle, tell you something about uh, the glory in which he died because he died winning for the King of England and all these lovely things. There's also a similar portrait done for the death of Montcalm um, which is lovely, 
and it's right here. And it's a little sitting funny in its frame, but that's all right. And this is very, it's not gonna, there we go. Okay, and this is, is very similar, and uh, that's very similar pose. And here we, get, we have Montcalm dying beautifully, no blood, but he's dying beautifully. He's surrounded by his men who are crying for him and they're weeping for him. And uh, you can see you have two Amerindians here in the lower corner, and they're burying a mortar, or actually they're not burying it, they're taking it out of the ground, the bomb fell into the ground and blew up, and so they're taking the, the, the empty shell out of the crater that it created, and this is kind of a, a nod to the fact that Montcalm was buried in a crater hole. Um, and it's also, again, making an acknowledgement of the Amerindian allies who fought with the French in the Seven Years' War. Um, and then you see other funny things in this picture, like a palm tree. <laughs> now, does that mean that the French thought that there were palm trees in northern Canada? No, it does not mean the French thought there were palm trees in northern Canada, because remember, this is more of a metaphor. And one of the symbols for America, because America was initially discovered in the Caribbean and in the south, one of the symbols of North America is this bizarre-looking tree. So this palm tree is in the picture, not because there are palm trees in northern Canada, but just to kind of give people who are looking at the picture a certain sense of place, that this is a, this is a North American setting. And you also see, way, way, way in the back, right here, you see kind of an outline of this portrait of the death of General Wolfe. And this is because, again, it was so beautiful and so dramatic. The two generals of the armies die in combat during the Battle for Quebec. Oh, it is so beautiful and romantic. And we tend to think of this as the end of the Seven Years' War in North America. But the end of the Seven Years' War in North America really happened off the coast of Brest, off the coast of France, um, in the Battle for Quiberon Bay. And the Battle of Quiberon Bay was a naval battle. Um, and essentially you have a, a large French fleet which is coming out of Brest in France and if you, if you Google map Quiberon Bay you'll, you'll get to see it and you can see a lovely map of it. And as the, the French fleet is exiting it's met by the British fleet and they fight and it's just not the French day. Uh, the British fleet pretty much takes out most of the French ships, a couple remain but most of them are, are, are sunk uh, or, or just put into a position where they, they are no longer useful for sailing at the moment, and the British fleet hardly has anything happen to it. And this is huge. Now remember, this is a global war. The French are fighting this war in India. They're fighting this war in Europe. They're fighting this war in North America. They're fighting it in the Caribbean. They're fighting it on the seas. They're fighting it everywhere. So in order to supply the army, in order to, give, to, to get orders from Paris to, um, uh, to North America, you need the navy, and the navy has to be able to navigate the seas very well. So if the French essentially lose the bulk of their navy, they're just not going to be able to give the help to North America that, North Ameri that, the, that the French troops in North America would need. So the French didn't necessarily have to lose North, North America with the Battle of Quebec, but really the fact that they no longer had a navy that they could use to supply, to give communications to North America, meant that the French, just decide the French state decided to let North America Leave, let, let it be on its own, let it fight its own battle. If they keep it, they can keep it. If they lose it, they lose it. But the French, they just do not have the resources at this moment to supply and to communicate with North America. And that the Battle of Quiberon Bay really is kind of like the, 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 the nail in the coffin uh, for the French presence in North America. So there are lots of major consequences for the Seven Years' War in North America, which I'd like to talk about now for just a few minutes. Um, and of course, everyone is interested about how, well, how did this influence the coming of the American Revolution? And it influenced in, in many ways, and I'm going to name a, name a couple of them. One is that by the end of the Seven Years' War, by the time, by the, time the battle has settled down everywhere and the treaty is signed in 1763, England is by far the most powerful nation in all of Europe which in some ways is great. Look, it has all these colonies, its army is everywhere, it won this big war, that's wonderful. But that also means, one, that England is greatly in debt. And so it's gonna have to start taxing its colonies. And of course, we're all familiar with the terrible Stamp Act um, and the, 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 um, uh, the unhappiness with American colonists at being taxed by the British and, uh, and what all that's gonna lead to. So that's one thing that's a consequence of the Seven Years' War is that, that, that England now needs money and it's gonna be taxing. Two, it means that if England is the most powerful nation in all of Europe, it has no friends in Europe. Because now everyone has a vested interest in bringing England down a notch or two in order to maintain a balance of power in Europe. England is now too powerful. That means France, Spain, anyone is going to be happy to see um, England get a little weaker. Uh, another important consequence is the Albany Congress in North America. And the Albany Congress met in 1754. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, a young Benjamin Franklin, and in fact there's a, a, a photograph of Benjamin Franklin that I'd like to show you. 
pretend it's here. Uh, and you can see that Benjamin Franklin uh, does not look like the typical balded, gray-haired man with spectacles that we usually think of. At one point, Benjamin Franklin was, in fact, young before he was old. And it's kind of fun to show your students uh, an unexpected picture of him. But in 1754, he's one of the people who arranged the Albany Congress um, as, a, as a way to talk about how to deal better with, with Amerindian relationships and also uh, as a way to uh, talk about unity. Because, of course, in the 18th century, each colony was kind of like its own little country. And they had different currencies, and they talked differently, and they were settled differently. And the people there had different customs. And people in Massachusetts did not necessarily understand people in Virginia. And so Benjamin Franklin is saying, well, if, if we want to be able to resist the French, and if we want to have better relationships with Amerindians, maybe it would be good if we were more united. And to, to illustrate that, he drew this lovely cartoon, Join or Die, with the broken up snake. Now, this cartoon is shown at the beginning of the HBO special on John Adams as being kind of an American Revolution thing. It's not an American Revolution thing. It's a 1754 Seven Years' War thing. Thank you very much. And I've seen people wave this around to argue for states' rights. And as a matter of fact, it does not mean anything about states' rights. It's actually making the point that if each state acts independently, the snake is dead because it's cut up into little pieces. So it's really trying to advertise for unity. And while this is not, and while the Albany Congress is not thinking about unifying and becoming independent from Britain at all at this point. It's an initial effort towards unity that we're going to see again in 1774 with the First Continental Congress. Um, uh, another effect of, uh, of the Seven Years' War in North America and how it's going to lead to the revolution is that, remember, the Seven Years' War is a large world war. And France and England fight each other all the time. It's kind of like a hobby. And so any peace treaty is, is, is really considered to be rather temporary. So it's, it's, sure, there's peace for now, but of course the French are looking ahead to the next engagement. So the French, very cleverly, have spies in North America looking around. I know spy is kind of a, has a, has a bit of a tinge to it, but there, there, there are Frenchmen in North America looking at the colonies and trying to take the temperature of the colonists and reporting back to Choiseul um, in France, who is, think of him as the Secretary of State equivalent about, uh, to just see if there's any possibility at, re at rebellion amongst the colonies. Because the French are already anticipating that if England is going to become weaker, it's going to start with its losing its own colonies in North America. So for the French, the war is not over yet. 